Before this, I've seen horsemen start to march and open the assault and muster ranks and seen them too at times beat their retreat. And on your land, oh, arts and ease, I've seen rangers and raiding parties galloping, the clash of tournaments, the rush of jousts, now done with trumpets, now with bells, and now with drums, and now with signs from castle walls, with native things, and with imported ware. But never yet have I seen horsemen, or seen infantry, or ship that sails by signal, or land, of land, or star, move to such strange a bugle. Yes, folks, uh, we're reading um, the Divine Comedy, uh, Dante's Inferno. This is actually one of the most uh, remarkable and monumental books that have actually ever been written in all of human history. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Jeff Williams, host of North Star Oasis, and for the next hour, we're going to look a little bit into the uh, period in which this was written. We're not going to give you a full excerpt on Dante, trust me. Um, but there are things that are going on in the world today, in, America, in American politics today, that actually, if you roll everything back, kind of have some roots in the Renaissance era. Now, I know you're thinking, what in the world? American politics in the 21st century going all the way back to like the, you know, 13th to 14th century? Uh, what's this connection? We're going to, there is actually a connection. It actually has to deal with one book, and it's and actually not uh, the Divine Comedy uh, known as Dante's Inferno. Uh, I will tell you right off the bat about Dante's Inferno. It is an important book because there are a lot of other people who have written things that we actually still read today for enjoyment that actually have its roots in Dante's Inferno. And well, one of the groups of authors was actually the Bronte sisters. Uh, but more on that later. In the meantime, we're going to go right on over to our Prager University segment, How Dark Were the Dark Ages? Good question. No period of history is more misunderstood or underappreciated than the Middle Ages. The 10 centuries from the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century to the start of the Renaissance in the 15th. This is especially true between the year 1000 when global warming brought grapes to England and grain to the coasts of Greenland, doubling the population and reviving town life all across Europe. And 1348, after the warming had ended and the Black Death arrived from the east. Let's take a closer look at these years. We'll make a good start by dispelling some nonsense. The people of the Middle Ages did not believe the earth was flat. They knew it was round. The ancients said it was round. The fathers of the church said it was round. They saw its shadow during an eclipse of the moon and the shadow was round. They saw masks of ships sinking below the horizon round. More nonsense. The Middle Ages were cheerless. Quite the reverse. They were full of color, of celebrations involving everybody in town. They invented the carnival. They revived popular drama which had lain dormant for a thousand years. Whatever they did, whether it was sinning or fighting or repenting or falling in love or traveling thousands of miles to Rome or to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they did it with energy and gusto. What do we owe to the Middle Ages? How about the university? Medieval man invented it. For the first time in the history of the world, you could go to Paris or Bologna or Padua or Oxford or Prague or Cologne and study under masters of law, medicine, philosophy, and theology, and your degree designating you as a master or a doctor would hold good anywhere in Europe. It was an international community of scholars. A young Thomas Aquinas, born in southern Italy at the beginning of the 13th century, would travel to Cologne to study philosophy under the philosopher biologist Albert the Great, then to Paris, where he taught theology and philosophy, then to Rome and back to France. And this sort of thing was the rule among scholars not the exception. How about modern science? Thomas's teacher, Albert, was a biologist. Why should that surprise us? Medieval man believed that God made the world as an ordered whole. They learned it both from scripture and from pagan thinkers, such as Aristotle. Science did not burst on the scene with Galileo. Copernicus died in the 16th century, 
but he was a priest astronomer at a Polish university founded in the Middle Ages. He wasn't even the first man to suggest that the Earth orbited the Sun. Others had ventured the suggestion. Most prominent was the late medieval Nicholas of Cusa, a philosopher and a cardinal in the church. How about architecture? If the Middle Ages were dark and ignorant, how come ordinary people, masons, carpenters, painters, sculptors, glazers, erected the most beautiful and majestic buildings to grace the earth, the Gothic cathedrals, without power tools, with pulleys and winches and scaffolding in their bare hands, they built up lacework in stone and glass, flooding vast interior spaces with color and light. We have nothing to match their complexity and beauty. And art? Studying the ancients, medieval man produced whole genres of art that the world had never seen. There had never been anything like Dante's Divine Comedy or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales or the Arthurian legends of Chrétien de Troyes or the paintings of Giotto or the astonishingly beautiful and precise work of the illuminators of manuscripts. What else do we owe to them? Western music. They invented our musical notation and Western harmony, not to mention the humble carols we enjoy at Christmas time. A tradition of local self-government. Witness the chartered towns all over Europe, free associations of men united for the common good, friars, guildsmen, members of lay orders devoted to good works, people who established schools, orphanages, and hospitals. Far from the Dark Ages, which it is popularly called, the Middle Ages might better be described as the Brilliant Ages, a startling epoch of progress from science to art, from philosophy to medicine. Indeed, in one crucial way, we are less civilized than those who enhanced human existence over a thousand years ago. We dismiss the achievements of our ancestors and fall short of them. They honored their ancestors and surpassed them. I'm Anthony Esselin of Providence College for Prager University. Join. And I hope you found that enlightening. Uh, I'm actually right now in the middle of a major study of the uh, Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages, and the um, and the Renaissance and subsequently the Reformation. We're really not going to talk about the Reformation at all today because I do want to actually talk about some modern stuff. Uh, but a lot of things that we have in our society today does take its roots in development from the High Middle Ages, which were the Dark Ages that were just alluded to, uh, and the Renaissance period. Now, of course, I don't even know what they're calling our current period simply because they don't name these periods until after a period of time has gone by and people look at a, a period in hindsight. You know, after things like World War II ended, well, what, what's the post-World War II era? Right now it's kind of called the post-World War II era. In about another 150 years, somebody will come up with another term that's going to be more fitting to the era that we're living in now. And, it, you know, is the era after the Cold War and after wars in, the, in, the, uh, you know, in Asia, the Middle East, uh, Korea, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, and after all of this has gone from the post-World uh, War II up through 2016 in the age of Trump, are we passing into a new era? I don't know. We're going to get into that one in, in, the, in the end of this next clip because I'm going to be bringing in the Renaissance, Was It a Thing? Uh, this is a crash course world history piece, but before we play that, uh, in the end he's going to ask the question about, well, you know, was it a thing? When the people living through it said no, I'm going okay, to just tell you this in advance. The people who were living through it weren't really looking at it as, hey, we're in a profound renaissance. But in our generation right now, people aren't looking at, at this and saying, hey, how are people 150 years from now or 400 years from now or 500 years from now going to take a look and say, what are we doing here in the 21st century and what are we going to name this period? So yes, I mean, the renaissance of the people living in it, it was just everyday life. It's the everyday life from back then, which is that building block. Okay, the end of the last clip we played, 
you know, honoring our ancestors. That's kind of what we need to do. And things are kind of falling apart in that regard. So after the high Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, you know, the, Middle Ages, the medieval period, which ended, which began with the fall of the Roman Empire, 476 A.D., and it went through to the 13, 1400s. Then we had the Renaissance era followed by the Reformation. So we're going to take a look right now at Crash Course World History, the Renaissance. Was it a thing? Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History. And today we're going to talk about something that ought to be more controversial, the Renaissance. So you probably already know about the Renaissance, thanks to the work of noted Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, and Raphael. But that isn't the whole story. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, what, what about Splinter? I think he was an architect. Oh, me from the past. You're such an idiot. Splinter was a painter, sculptor, and an architect. He was quite a Renaissance rat. <laughs> Right, so the story goes that the Renaissance saw the rebirth of European culture after the miserable Dark Ages and that it ushered in the modern era of secularism, rationality, and individualism. And those are all on the list of things we like here at Crash Course. Mr. Green, I think you're forgetting Cool Ranch Doritos. Yeah, fair enough. Then what's so controversial? Well, the whole idea of a European Renaissance presupposes that Europe was like an island unto itself that was briefly enlightened when the Greeks were ascendant and then lost its way and then rediscovered its former European glory. Furthermore, I'm going to argue that the Renaissance didn't even necessarily happen. But first, let's assume that it did. Essentially, the Renaissance was an efflorescence of arts, primarily visual, but also to a lesser extent literary, and ideas in Europe that coincided with the rediscovery of Roman and Greek culture. It's easiest to see this in terms of visual art. Renaissance art tends to feature a focus on the human form, somewhat idealized, as Roman and especially Greek art had. And this classicizing is also rather apparent in the architecture of the Renaissance, which featured all sorts of Greek columns and triangular pediments and Roman arches and domes. In fact, looking at a Renaissance building, you might even be able to fool yourself into thinking you're looking at an actual Greek building if you sort of squint and ignore the fact that Greek buildings tend to be, you know, ruins. In addition to rediscovering, that is, copying Greek and Roman art, the Renaissance saw the rediscovery of Greek and Roman writings and their ideas. And that opened up a whole new world for scholars. Well, not a new world, actually, since the texts were more than a thousand years old. But you know what I mean. The scholars who examined, translated, and commented upon these writings were called humanists, which can be a little bit of a confusing term because it implies that they were concerned with, you know, humans rather than, say, the religious world. Which can add to the common but totally incorrect assumption that Renaissance writers and artists and scholars were, like, secretly not religious. That's a favorite area of speculation on the internet and in Dan Brown novels, but the truth is that Renaissance artists were religious. As evidence, let me present you with the fact that they painted the Madonna over and over and over and over and over and Stan! Anyway, all humanism means is that these scholars studied what were called the humanities, literature, philosophy, history. Today, of course, these areas of study are known as the so-called dark arts. What? Liberal arts? Oh, Stan, you're always making history less fun. I want to be a professor of the dark arts. A dark arts job. It's a dangerous position. Yeah, I guess that's true. So I'll, we'll stick with this. Right, so here at Crash Course, we try not to focus too much on dates, but if I'm going to convince you that the Renaissance didn't actually happen, I should probably tell you, you know, when it didn't happen. So traditionally, the Renaissance is associated with the 15th and 16th centuries. Ish. The Renaissance happened all across Europe, but we're going to focus on Italy because I want to and I own the video camera. Plus, Italy really spawned the Renaissance. What was it about Italy that lent itself to Renaissancing? Was it the wine, the olives, the pasta, the plumbers, the relative permissiveness when it comes to the moral lassitude of their leaders? Well, let's go to the thought bubble. Italy was primed for Renaissance for exactly one reason. Money. A society has to be super rich to support artists and elaborate building projects and to feed scholars who translate and comment on thousand-year-old documents and the Italian city-states were very wealthy for two reasons. First, many city-states were mini industrial powerhouses, each specializing in a particular industrial product, like Florence made cloth, Milan made arms. Second, the cities of Venice and Genoa got stinking rich from trade. Genoa turned out a fair number of top-notch sailors, like, for instance, Christopher Columbus, but the Venetians became the richest city-state of all. As you'll remember from the Crusades, the Venetians were expert sailors, shipbuilders, and merchants, and as you'll remember from our discussions of Indian Ocean trade, they also had figured out ways to trade with Islamic empires, including the biggest economic power in the region, the Ottomans. 
Without trading with the Islamic world, especially in pepper, Venice couldn't have afforded all those painters, nor would they have had money to pay for the incredibly fancy clothes they put on to pose for their fancy portraits. The clothes, the paint, the painters, enough food to get a double chin, all of that was paid for with money from trade with the Ottomans. I know I talk a lot about trade, but that's because it's so incredibly awesome, and it really does bind the world together. And while trade can lead to conflicts, on balance, it has been responsible for more peaceful contacts than violent ones because, you know, death is bad for business. This was certainly the case in the Eastern Mediterranean, where the periods of trade-based diplomacy were longer and more frequent. Hey, did you notice what he just said? He just said capitalism is good. Historically, capitalism is good. Uh, while a few bad things do happen, capitalism and the pursuit of profit is the thing that has been driving, driving human advancement for centuries. He's got it right. Let's go back to the video. ...than periods of war, even though all we ever talk about is war because it's very dramatic, which is why my brother Hank's favorite video game is called Assassin's Creed, not some Venetian guys negotiate a trade treaty. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So here's another example of non-Europeans supporting the Renaissance. The Venetians exported textiles to the Ottomans. They were usually woven in other cities like Florence, and the reason Florentine textiles were so valuable is because their color remained vibrant. That was because they were dyed with a chemical called alum, which was primarily found in Anatolia, in the Ottoman Empire. So to make the textiles the Ottomans craved, the Italians needed Ottoman alum, at least until 1460, when Giovanni de Castro, Pope Pius II's godson, discovered alum in Italy in Tolfa. And he wrote to his godfather, the Pope, today I bring you victory over the Turk. Every year they wring from the Christians more than 300,000 ducats for the alum with which we dye wool various colors, but I have found seven mountains so rich in this material that they could supply seven worlds. If you will give orders to engage workmen, build furnaces, and smelt the ore, you will provide all Europe with alum, and the Turk will lose all his profits. Instead, they will accrue to you. So the Pope was like, heck yeah! More importantly, he granted a monopoly on the mining rights of alum to a particular Florentine family. The Medicis, you know, the ones you always see painted. But vitally, Italian alum mines didn't bring victory over the Turks or cause them to lose all their profits, just as mining and drilling at home never obviate the need for trade. Okay, one last way the Islamic world helped to create the European Renaissance, if indeed it happened. The Muslim world was the source of many of the writings that Renaissance scholars studied. For centuries, Muslim scholars have been working their way through ancient Greek writings, especially Ptolemy and Aristotle, who despite being consistently wrong about everything managed to be the jumping off point for thinking both in the Christian and Muslim worlds. And the fall of Constantinople in 1453 helped further spread Greek ideas because Byzantine scholars fled for Italy, taking their books with them, so we have the Ottomans to thank for that too. And even after it became a Muslim capital, Istanbul was still like the number one destination for book nerds searching for ancient Greek texts. Plus, if we stretch our definition of Renaissance thought to include scientific thought, there is a definite case to be made that Muslim scholars influenced Copernicus, arguably the Renaissance's greatest mind. Oh, it's time for the open letter. An open letter to Copernicus. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Wow, the heliocentric solar system. Cool. Earth in the middle, sun in the middle, earth in the middle, sun in the middle. Ptolemy, Copernicus, Ptolemy, Copernicus. Right, an open letter to Copernicus. Dear Copernicus, why you always gotta make the rest of us look so bad? You were both a lawyer and a doctor? That doesn't seem fair. You spoke four languages and discovered that the Earth is not the center of the universe? Come on! But at least you didn't discover it entirely on your own. Now, there's no way to be sure that you had access to Muslim scholarship on this topic. But one of your diagrams is so similar to a proof found in an Islamic mathematics treatise that it's almost impossible you didn't have access to it. Even the letters on the diagram are almost the same, so at least I can tell my mom that when she asks why I'm not a doctor and a lawyer and the guy who discovered the heliocentric solar system. Best wishes, John Green. All right, so now having spent the last several minutes telling you why the Renaissance happened in Italy and not in, I don't know, like India or Russia or whatever, I'm going to argue that the Renaissance did not in fact happen. Let's start with the problem of time. The Renaissance isn't like the Battle of Hastings or the French Revolution where people were aware that they were living amid history. Like when I was 11 and most of you didn't exist yet, my dad made my brother and me turn off the Cosby show and watch people climbing on the Berlin
Berlin Wall so we could see history. But no one like woke their kids up in a Tuscan village in 1512 like, Mario, Luigi, come outside, the Renaissance is here. Hurry, we're living in a glorious new era where man's relationship to learning is changing. I somehow feel a new sense of individualism based on my capacity for reason. No, in fact, most people in Europe were totally unaware of the Renaissance because its art and learning affected a tiny sliver of the European population. Like life expectancy in many areas of Europe actually went down during the Renaissance. Art and learning of the Renaissance didn't filter down to most people the way that technology does today. And really the Renaissance was only experienced by the richest of the rich and those people, like painters, who served them. I mean there were some commercial opportunities like for framing paintings or binding books, but the vast majority of Europeans still lived on farms either as free peasants or tenants. And the rediscovery of Aristotle didn't in any way change their lives, which were governed by the rising and setting of the sun and intellectually by the Catholic Church. In fact, probably about 95% of Europeans never encountered the Renaissance as opulence or art or modes of thought. We have constructed the Renaissance as important not because it was so central to the 15th century. I mean, at the time, Europe wasn't the world's leader in anything other than the tiny business of Atlantic trade. We remember it as important because it matters to us now. It gave us the Ninja Turtles. We care about Aristotle and individualism and the Mona Lisa and the possibility that Michelangelo painted an anatomically correct brain onto the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel because these things give us a narrative that makes sense. Europe was enlightened and then it was unenlightened and then it was re-enlightened and ever since it's been the center of art and commerce and history. See that cycle of life and death and rebirth a lot in historical recollection, but it just isn't accurate. So it's true that many of the ideas introduced to Europe in the 15th and 16th 16th centuries became very important. But remember, when we talk about the Renaissance, we're talking about hundreds of years. I mean, although they share ninja turtledom, Donatello and Raphael were born 97 years apart. And the Renaissance humanist Petrarch was born in 1304, 229 years before the Renaissance humanist Montaigne. That's almost as long as the United States has existed. So was the Renaissance a thing? Not really. It was a lot of mutually interdependent things that occurred over centuries. Stupid truth, always resisting simplicity. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is produced and directed by Stan Muller. Our script supervisor is Danica Johnson. The show is written by my high school history teacher, Raul Meyer, Come back and to myself. Me. And so uh, there is one important thing that did happen, and it wasn't at the Renaissance. It was actually at the Reformation. Uh, it was right after the, in the, in the waning period that we call the Renaissance was when you had... Martin Luther and uh, uh, John Calvin and uh, another guy, uh, was it Herman uh, Zwingli, they challenged the Catholic Church. Now this goes back to the very thing that triggered the, Reform the Renaissance was the printing press. And it was during the Reformation in the 1500s that the literacy rate throughout Germany increased and more and more people were reading and the Gutenberg Bible came out and it was a changeover from the Latin Vulgate into oh, Martin Luther was the first German uh, translation of the scripture into the native tongue of that people could understand. I mean, you don't read Latin, do you? Do you read the Old Testament Hebrew or Greek? No, you don't. If you were to read the Bible or anything else, you will either read it in English, Spanish, if you happen to you know, be of uh, Hispanic origin, uh, Arabic, if, or uh, whatever language is in uh, Somali, if you're from Somalia, Aramaic. or Aramaic. Uh, and then same thing with Hmong and the Asian languages. If you're going to read and be fluent, you're going to read in your native tongue. And if your native tongue is not Latin, then what do you have for a source of higher knowledge? And that's the way it was back in the Middle Ages, that we had a, a peasantry uh, worldwide that was not enlightened, to use that uh, 18th century term, was not enlightened because they were illiterate. Why were they illiterate? Because they didn't have a printing press. Why what, the printing press wasn't in, in, in the, pr the early printing press has around 1350, 1360 in China or Japan. You know, is is one of the Asian countries when the first mass production of print on paper came about. 
that was still a very primitive system. It wasn't until Gutenberg with the mechanical printing press roughly around 1460 that things really took off. And as we've discussed in previous episodes of North Star Oasis, you had the plague that spread throughout Europe in the 1340s, 1347 to 1352. So we were getting out of, this, out of the plague, still a very illiterate society, and then all of a sudden here comes this thing called paper and printing, and you can mass produce this stuff pretty quickly compared, compared to hand scribing everything out. But that really hadn't quite caught up in the Renaissance now. The, the wealthy actually did have access to reading, good instruction, the university system that was created during the Middle Ages. But it didn't hit the common person until the Reformation. And that was when Martin Luther worked with the peasantry in, in pamphlets, in, in spreading the gospel through the pamphlets, and people were reading these arguments in their native tongue. And then from there came to question authority. They questioned the Catholic Church, tried reforming the Catholic Church. And in 1525, you had a peasants' revolt. We're not going to get into all of that today, but again, to look at the Renaissance and why it didn't impact the, the common person, because it was the Reformation which really had all of these institutional changes that impacted society into what we would now call some semblance of modernity. But there was still a very important contribution in you know, Ptolemy. Ptolemy was the guy who wrote the maps, port to port to port to port to port. They had charted the Mediterranean basin very, very well. But the theory back then in the 1300s was that, well, in England, that's kind of the end. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing. You can sail beyond, but there's nothing out there. So if you're going to go to, the, to get spices, and you notice how in that last video we had talked about getting alum from Turkey, can you imagine what it took to get pepper? Pepper, you had to go to the Spice Islands, which were like Indonesia. But you couldn't get there except for going east. So you had to go around to the bottom of Africa and into the Indian Ocean. It's a long, treacherous voyage. Or you had to do the overland route, the Silk Road through China. You know, trade happened, as we noticed with Italy, but just getting something like salt and pepper and salt that you know the Europeans really got a pension for salt through the Crusades because the salt they, they brought back salt from the Middle East or not, not salt excuse me sugar they brought back sugar from the Middle East they never had sugar and all of a sudden oh we got something that's really, really kind of cool Wow, I want more of this stuff. I can only get it over there, and I really don't have a direct route. So it was important to get a direct route. It was actually Christopher Columbus, who, from Genoa, had figured, well, let's, if we go west, we'll come east. That it's only natural that we go from this end of the map, from Ptolemy's map, but uh, if we go that way, we can just like you know come back on the other side. And this comes around the time of Copernicus and the discussion about whether it's flat Earth or round Earth. And what do we have? The discovery of America by Europeans. I still like to argue in favor of uh, Leif Erikson and the Vikings, which went into Newfoundland back around uh, 1000 AD. But that's just me as a descendant of Vikings. But nonetheless, this is why things are important. The Middle Ages, end of the Roman Empire, through the time where things were individualized in small rural communities, literacy rate was low, it was an aristocracy, it was a small little aristocracy. It just kind of looks, it looks like today. The 1%, oh, we had 1% 500 years ago, 600 years ago. We had a 1%. It was the Reformation that kind of evened things out. And the Re Reformation was built upon the Renaissance. And of course, I'm going to bring up the fact that there were still some standards then, a lot of standards, a lot of high standards. If you look at the artwork that existed back then, 
There was a very, in, in, in the high Middle Ages through the Renaissance and into the Reformation, there was a quality thing with, when it came to the artists, the, sculpture, the sculptors and the, and the painters. Man, some of the Renaissance and Reformation era artwork and high Middle Ages artwork is just impressive compared to some of the junk you see on the market today. That's what we're going to look at right now, why our modern art is so bad. Now, don't worry, there is a place I'm going with this, so please bear with me here. Uh, but we get terrible modern art, and there is a reason why, and we're going to examine that right now. The Mona Lisa, the Pietà, the girl with a pearl earring. For a score of centuries, artists enriched Western society with their works of astonishing beauty. The Night Watch, the Thinker, the Rocky Mountains. Master after master, from Leonardo to Rembrandt to Bierstadt, produced works that inspired, uplifted, and deepened us. And they did this by demanding of themselves the highest standards of excellence, improving upon the work of each previous generation of masters, and continuing to aspire to the highest quality attainable. But something happened on the way to the 20th century. The profound, the inspiring, and the beautiful were replaced by the new, the different, and the ugly. Today, the silly, the pointless, and the purely offensive are held up as the best of modern art. Michelangelo carved his David out of a rock. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art just offers us a rock. A rock, all 340 tons of it. That's how far standards have fallen. How did this happen? How did the thousand-year ascent towards artistic perfection and excellence die out? It didn't. It was pushed out. Beginning in the late 19th century, a group dubbed the Impressionists rebelled against the French Academy de Beaux-Arts and its demand for classical standards. Whatever their intentions, the new modernists sowed the seeds of aesthetic relativism, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder mentality. Today, everybody loves the Impressionists. And as with most revolutions, the first generation or so produced work of genuine merit. Monet, Renoir, and Degas still maintained elements of disciplined design and execution. But with each new generation, standards declined until there were no standards. All that was left was personal expression. The great art historian Jacob Rosenberg wrote that quality in art is not merely a matter of personal opinion, but to a high degree objectively traceable. But the idea of a universal standard of quality in art is now usually met with strong resistance, if not open ridicule. How can art be objectively measured, I'm challenged. In responding, I simply point to the artistic results produced by universal standards compared to what is produced by relativism. The former gave the world the birth of Venus and the dying Gaul, while the latter has given us the Holy Virgin Mary, fashioned with cow dung and pornographic images, and Petra, the prize-winning sculpture of a policewoman squatting and urinating, complete with a puddle of synthetic urine. Without aesthetic standards, we have no way to determine quality or inferiority. Here's a test I give my graduate students, all talented and well-educated. Please analyze this Jackson Pollock painting and explain why it is good. It is only after they give very eloquent answers that I inform them that the painting is actually a close-up of my studio apron. I don't blame them. I would probably have done the same since it's nearly impossible to differentiate between the two. And who will determine quality is another challenge I'm given. If we are to be intellectually honest, we all know of situations where professional expertise is acknowledged and depended upon. Take figure skating in the Olympics, where artistic excellence is judged by experts in the field. Surely we would flinch at the contestant who indiscriminately threw himself across the ice and demanded that his routine be accepted as being as worthy of value as that of the most disciplined skater. Not only has the quality of art diminished, but also the subject matter has gone from the transcendent to the trashy. Where once artists applied their talents to scenes of substance and integrity from history, literature, religion, mythology, etc., many of today's artists merely use their art to make statements, often for nothing more than shock value. Artists of the past also made statements at times, 
but never at the expense of the visual excellence of their work. It's not only artists who are at fault. It is equally the fault of the so-called art community, the museum heads, gallery owners, and the critics who encourage and financially enable the production of this rubbish. It is they who champion graffiti and call it genius, promote the scatological and call it meaningful. It is they who, in reality, are the naked emperors of art, for who else would spend $10 million on a rock and think it is art? But why do we have to be victims of all this bad taste? We don't. By the art we patronize at museums or purchase at galleries, we can make our opinions not only known but felt. An art gallery, after all, is a business like any other. If the product doesn't sell, it won't be made. We can also support organizations like the Art Renewal Center that work to restore objective standards to the art world. And we can advocate the teaching of classical art appreciation in our schools. Let's celebrate what we know is good and ignore what we know is not. By the way, the white background you see behind me is not simply a white graphic backdrop. It is a pure white painting by noted artist Robert Rauschenberg at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. I'm Robert Florzak for Prager University. And there you have it. Boy, have we ever declined, haven't we? Same thing goes with politics, but in a way we have, in a way we haven't. Because the Renaissance era gave us one important book. This is the other one, Dante's Inferno. This is the other important one. This is the one that we, what we look at when we want to be introspective. We want to look at society. We want to look at, essentially, um, um, the way that um, Dante looked at hell. Nine, nine, uh, nine levels of hell. You've got to go, to go through hell in order to get to heaven. That's really what the Divine Comedy is. Long epic poem. But the other one was from a man named Niccolo Machiavelli. Born May 3rd, 1469, died 21 June 1527. An Italian diplomat, politician, historian, philosopher, writer, playwright, and poet. This man can teach us a lot. And in a way he has through one book, The Prince. Let's take a look right now a little bit more at the life of Niccolo Machiavelli. We're often appalled by how sly and dishonest many politicians are, but we shouldn't be. In moves like this, we need to remember and read the works of Niccolo Machiavelli, a late 15th century political advisor and political theorist who argued that we shouldn't think that politicians are immoral and simply bad for lying and dissembling and manoeuvring. A good politician, in Machiavelli's remarkable view, isn't one who is friendly and honest and kind. It's someone, however occasionally dark and underhand they might be, who knows how to defend, enrich, and bring honour to the state, which is also an extremely important goal. Being nice may well be a virtue in general, but what citizens most need from their rulers is effectiveness, which may well call upon some darker arts. Once we understand this basic requirement, we stand to be less disappointed and clearer about what we want from our politicians. Niccolo Machiavelli was born in Florence in 1469. His father was a lawyer, and so Machiavelli received an extensive formal education and got his first job as a secretary for the city of Florence. But soon after his appointment, Florence exploded politically and expelled the Medici family, who'd ruled it for 60 years, and suffered decades of political instability and turmoil. As a consequence, Machiavelli experienced a series of career reversals. Over just a few decades, he went from being an important diplomat to a semi-successful general to an enemy of the state, tortured and then exiled when the Medici returned to power. Although Machiavelli was rather a failed politician, he can be remembered as a truly great man because of two works he wrote, The Prince and The Discourses. In them, he attends to a central problem of politics then as now, that it's almost impossible to be both a good politician and a good person in the traditional Christian sense. Machiavelli proposed that the overwhelming responsibility of a good prince is to defend the state from external and internal threats to stable governance. 
This means he must know how to fight, but more importantly, he must know about reputation and the management of those around him. People should neither think he is soft and easy to disobey, nor should they find him so cruel that he disgusts his society. He should seem unapproachably strict, but reasonable. When Machiavelli turned to the question of whether it was better for a prince to be loved or feared, he wrote that while it would theoretically be wonderful for a leader to be both loved and obeyed, a prince should always err on the side of inspiring terror, for this is ultimately what keeps people in check. Machiavelli's Christian contemporaries had suggested that princes... Okay, I wanted to use that clip mainly for Machiavelli's uh, biography, but notice there about liked versus feared. Look back at modern presidential candidates. Who wanted to be loved? Mitt Romney, John McCain. Uh, and probably even go back to um, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Michael Dukakis. Who wanted to be feared? Who was feared? Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. Who are the ones who are actually ruling? Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. The Bushes were kind of in the middle. Bill Clinton was kind of in the middle. You know, with the Bushes, they were, they were trying to balance both being liked and feared, being liked within the Republican Party and liked enough to get elected and then feared within the Republican Party and feared enough to get elected. But they, that became lukewarm and wishy-washy because they were still always trying to balance whether they want to be loved or feared. Which, which was more important. With Obama and Hillary Clinton, we, didn't, we don't necessarily see that, nor do we see that with Trump. Now, we're gonna take a look at another clip here that explains Machiavelli's The Prince, um, I think a little bit better than the, the clip that we had just had. I, I could sit here and narrate all of this, but I, I think the graphics, you know, the, the, they do a really, really great job with these graphics, more better than I could ever do. Uh, even though I know the, this material, it's just, that's why I do clips like this, because of the graphic content. So we're going to go to The Prince Explained in three minutes. A nation state can either be a republic or a principality, and either old or new. An old hereditary state that has been passed down the generations is easy to rule, but taking control and then holding onto a new state is difficult. The difficulty is reduced if you personally supervise it. An old hereditary state, such as a monarchy, can be taken by destroying the entire royal family. This is what Alexander the Great did to conquer and hold on to the Persian Empire of Darius III. However, states that are used to freedom must be crushed. For those who are not yet princes, it is possible to rise to become one by carrying out two steps. Follow the example of those in the past who saw their opportunities, and be well armed. To keep hold of a new state securely, all resistance must be destroyed by using cruel, swift and firm methods, but then benefits to the people should be given gradually. A prince must win the favour of the people and dispel any hostility but he will only be truly secure when he can raise his own army to defend against all comers. Mercenaries cannot be relied on, neither can other people's armies. To be successful, a prince must read history, study war and know his own land. He must give the appearance of being good, but also know how to be evil. He should not be afraid to be thought of as mean, as giving liberally and spending freely will lead to ruin. He also shouldn't worry about being thought of as cruel, as fear is one of the only things he can control. A prince should be willing to use cunning if needed, and deception if necessary. He may or may not be loved, but as long as he is not hated, he is secure. Fortresses are of little use, as even though they can be used to defend against outsiders, they do not stop you being betrayed by your own people. A prince must be purposeful, determined and unwavering. He must clearly follow one path or another. He should encourage art and craft, commerce and agriculture, entertain his people with spectacles and festivities, rewarding those who honour his state. Only capable servants should be used by a prince, and he should keep them under control. Anybody who flatters must be avoided. Machiavelli claimed that the once powerful princes of Italy lost their power not through misfortune, but by their own inaction and indecisiveness. Fortune directs half of our actions, 
but the other half is left for us to direct through hard work, cautiousness and virtue. Fortune needs to be beaten and dominated. It is often like a torrential river that cannot be stopped, but during periods of calm, preparations can be made to control and minimise the damage. Machiavelli concludes by stating that a leader is needed that will follow the advice in the book, to conquer Italy and free her from the barbarians. So folks, with that, I give you today's politics. Machiavelli's The Prince. Highly encourage you to read it. And don't think you're going to sit there and just pick it up and say, hmm, boy, this is just really absolutely fascinating. It is dry reading. It is dull. You have to study this book. Trust me on that. I've read it a few times. Some of it I still don't understand. Because i got to try it again a third time. But the fact is, we have people in Washington who know this stuff. That's the game that they're playing. Because I know this because I've studied history, politics, and war. I've been around the political institutions. I know what's going on, and that's what I keep trying just about every week, is giving you a little bit more insight as to what the bigger picture is. And this last week, some really major things have finally started to drop. The stuff that I actually been talking about for months, be on the lookout for what happens here. When this happens this, we can watch for that. I'm thinking that this might happen, but I'm not sure if it's this or that. These things are all starting to happen. Two things that I'm going to mention, well, three things I'm going to mention uh, before we play the next clip. First one, keep an eye on Bill de Blasio. I said that months ago. Bill de Blasio was Hillary Clinton's 2000 campaign manager or when she ran for U.S. Senate. Bill de Blasio has been in the Clinton camp for a very, very, very long time. He has been a very loyal confidant. He has never strayed. He has always been doing the bidding for the Clintons. And so if Bill de Blasio stays in the presidential race, I always felt that he was going to be the odds-on favorite. But if he doesn't get enough traction, he's going to exit the race once Hillary Clinton makes a decision who to support, who to throw her support behind. And the thing about it is she's not going to be open and, uh, and public and, te and tell you about it, but things happen behind the scenes because she still controls the Democrat National Committee. Barack Obama was the other one that you got to watch for. Obama hides it a little bit better. I thought, I wasn't sure if it was Obama pushing Beto O'Rourke or if it was O'Rourke trying to curry favor with Obama because O'Rourke had hired a lot of Obama staffers, campaign staffers. So there was a connection there, but it just didn't seem to go anywhere for the same reason it didn't go with Bill de Blasio. The larger Democrat populace said no to both of them. Now, you've got to look at the ages of the front runners. Joe Biden, he's almost 80. Uh, right behind him, you have uh, Bernie Sanders. He's getting up there in the mid-70s, almost, almost 80. And then you have behind him, Elizabeth Warren. Behind, behind Elizabeth Warren, you really start getting into that next generation of any serious contenders. This is the last chance the Democrats are going to be able to push a baby boom candidate for president. And that decision, I really firmly believe, was made this last week. Last week, Bill de Blasio, in the last 10 days, Bill de Blasio dropped out of the presidential race. And I believe that that is responsible for Elizabeth Warren surging in the polls right now. And I've heard some scuttlebutt that... Um, Bernie Sanders is offering a lot of key campaign support, even though he's technically still in the race. And something I had speculated back in 2015, but I couldn't put my finger on it, was I did think that Obama was pushing Bernie Sanders up to uh, run against Hillary Clinton, because we know that there is no love loss between the Clintons and the Obamas. And it's looking more and more like what I had uh, speculated and postured, postured back then may very well have been correct that if that is still the case, there is a uh, uh, Sanders-Obama tie that in, in the campaign, uh, face of the campaign at least, it explains why Bernie got back in line right after uh, losing the nomination. And then, as he has been uh, fading, why he's willing to support uh, 
Elizabeth Warren. It appears to me that Elizabeth Warren has the backing of both the Obama and Clinton factions within the Democratic National Committee. Therefore, I expect that Elizabeth Warren, unless she takes herself out of the race by doing something really stupid, I actually see Elizabeth Warren being the next presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. Now, what has that got to do with uh, what's coming up with the last little bit of the show? First of all, Mayor Bill de Blasio dropped out of the 2020 presidential race. Let's take a look. I feel very, very good about this campaign. I wish I could have started early. Uh, but the reality is there were a lot of things that I had to do here first. Mayor Bill de Blasio ended his campaign much the same way it started, by defending his ability to run for president and run the city of New York at the same time. From the beginning, public housing and police union protesters followed him across the country. And there are a lot of people around this nation who are not aware of the mayor's actual record in New York City. And of late, pressure at home had been mounting on him to drop out, with many regular New Yorkers treating his run as a punchline. He's supposed to be in that building every day and he's gone. Let it go. Leave the presidential run, come back to New York City and do your job as mayor of New York. But ultimately, the mayor says it was the debate qualifying that did him in. Private insurance is not working for tens of millions of Americans. When you talk about the co-pays, the deductibles, the premiums, the out-of-pocket expenses, it's not working. <coughs> After making and performing relatively well in the first two debates, the mayor says his inability to get enough donors and polling support for the third and upcoming fourth debate made continuing his campaign unrealistic. They they did become the main street of the campaign, and um, and that affected everything. If you were in those, you had much more ability to get your message out and to attract support. Throughout the last four months, de Blasio often tried to make himself more relevant by mixing it up with President Trump on social media. Today, the president took delight in de Blasio's defeat, sarcastically tweeting, part-time mayor of New York City Bill de Blasio, who was polling at a solid zero but had tremendous room for growth, has shockingly dropped out of the presidential race. NYC is devastated. He's coming home. This as leading progressive candidates Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren complimented the mayor on his campaign and ideas. We asked if he'd endorse either of them or theoretically serve in their administrations. What I want to do is continue my work as mayor, two years, three months, 11 days, uh, and at some point uh, we'll decide what to do about the primary election. And that's your Rush Block, your news, traffic, and weather in five minutes or less. A weekend op-ed in the New York Times set off a flurry of social media responses from lawmakers and the president himself, who multiple times sent out tweets over the weekend in defense of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh following new information on allegations of sexual misconduct. Now, the president referred to Kavanaugh as a, quote, innocent man who had been treated horribly. Kavanaugh, you remember, was confirmed last October after hearings in the Senate over a sexual assault allegation from his high school years. Now, the New York Times now reports that Kavanaugh faced a separate allegation from his time at Yale and that the FBI did not investigate that claim. Now, the latest claim mirrors one offered during that confirmation process by Deborah Ramirez, a Yale classmate who claimed that Kavanaugh exposed himself to her during a drunken party. And he previously had testified during that Senate Judiciary Committee that he denied all allegations. But in the meantime, we have seen the Democrats, many of those presidential hopefuls as well, use their own hashtags throughout the weekend and call for impeachments of Kavanaugh. You can see Julian Castro's tweet right there, Kamala Harris and others, Elizabeth Warren weighing in. But at the same time, we've also seen others coming to the defense, and that includes Senate Majority Leader L Mitch McConnell right there, who says, fortunately, a majority of senators and the American people rallied behind principles he says such as due process and he is standing by Kavanaugh he says for years of service to come so we're going to continue to follow this that article again was a summary of a book that is expected to come out this week so expect to hear more about this one in the meantime Wes over to you if you're kind of sick of hearing okay so I know uh, I ended up talking about Bill de Blasio dropping out and then Trump defending Brett Kavanaugh after new sexual misconduct allegations surfaced. The thing behind that is the uh, whole thing about impeachment. Hillary Clinton and the Democratic machine making up their mind triggers a whole bunch of other things for the 2020 election. Bill de Blasio dropping out signals that they made a decision. The whole Brett Kavanaugh, it's another smear. 
And New York Times left out key details like the person who uh, was said to have had all of that happen to her didn't remember any of that happening. So how can you come out and just make an allegation with no factual evidence? Kind of what happened a year ago. A year ago, all of this stuff came out against Brett Kavanaugh, and then as soon as he gets confirmed, it goes away, and then we find out after the fact, oh, most of it was made up anyway, if not all of it. And then a year later, it's all brought back up again because somebody wrote it in a book. Somebody remembered something. That's how the game is played, folks. Fear. Loved or feared. Machiavelli, the prince. So now here we have Elizabeth Warren. She is surging in the Democrat presidential race. Let's take a look. Senator Elizabeth Warren took her campaign before a large crowd in New York City where she vowed to attack political corruption if elected president. Corruption has broken our economy and corruption is breaking our democracy. I know what's broken. I've got a plan to fix it. And that's why I'm running for president of the United States. Warren has been rising in the polls for months and has emerged as a top challenger to the front runner, former Vice President Joe Biden. Everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Even his supporters. No, everybody, even his supporters know. They have no illusions. But we got to let them know who we are. We got to let them know who we are. The candidates are back on the campaign trail after last week's spirited debate in Houston. During the debate, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker urged his rivals to temper their attacks on one another. We've got one shot to make Donald Trump a one-term president, and we cannot lose it by the way we talk about each other or demonize and degrade each other. After three debates, Biden... And we're going to leave that right there where it sits. Cory Booker just said a key thing. We have one shot at making Donald Trump a one-term president. One shot. And that, folks, is what is happening now with this talk about uh, an impeachment inquiry from the U.S. House of Representatives and this whole deal over the Ukraine. The, the, the thing about the Ukraine in, the, in the, just the brief moment we have left... This is the chance of getting Joe Biden out of the race. That, that's all it is. Um, they're trying to get Joe Biden out. Uh, let me just quickly look at election 2020 on uh, the polls. Democrat presidential nomination as of today, the 26th of September. Joe Biden, 28.4%. Elizabeth Warren, 21.1%. Bernie Sanders, 17.1%. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, 5.5%, and then uh, Kamala Harris at 5%, and then everybody else is below that. Amy Klobuchar comes in at 1.5%. The fact is, Joe Biden is at 28.4%. Now that the Democrat National Committee has made their decision, and the decision is not Joe Biden to try to clear the field, that this whole talk about uh, what's going on in the Ukraine, that is not actually about getting Donald Trump. Donald Trump is just collateral damage right now. Joe Biden is the target. Biden did improper, you know, improper stuff as vice president. They're not defending Obama's record. They're not defending Biden. Biden is not their choice. They are trying to push Joe Biden out of the field. Now, they're trying to do that in a way of still being able to give Donald Trump a black eye and bring up impeachment, and that's the thing about Brett Kavanaugh is bring up the word impeachment to get in your mind in the next year the word impeachment, 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 impeachment. That's all this is about. This is trying to run up Donald Trump's negatives starting from now into the next year so you do not vote for him. And that they want Elizabeth Warren as their presidential candidate and as president because they have one shot left to do what they want. One shot left. What's going to happen if, if Donald Trump wins? What's going to happen in uh, 2025? They don't even know. So, for Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host Jeff Williams. Thanks for watching North Star Oasis. See you next week.